So we're getting a new Indiana Jones, played by one of the best possible actors you could ever hope for to play Indiana Jones. Unless we were able to like jump in a DeLorean and go back in time and get like the young version of Harrison Ford and then bring him forward into today. But he would probably then run into like old grumpy Harrison Ford, which would result in some kind of showdown between old Harrison Ford versus young Harrison Ford, which is actually a great idea. I've been waiting for you. But either way, Chris Pratt is perfect for Indiana Jones. And this has been described as a James Bond style reboot for Indiana Jones, in the sense that you just swap the actor out and you continue on with a new story, no explanation or new origin story needed. And that's great. But rebooting Indiana Jones for the modern age is actually a lot more tricky than you might think. So, let's get into it. Racial stereotypes have always been a bit of a problem for Indiana Jones, most notably in Temple of Doom. Chilled monkey brain. But while you could maybe get away with that back in the 80s, there is no way you could get away with that kind of stuff today. <coughs> in fact, they barely even got away with it back then. So in making an Indiana Jones for the 21st century, you need to steer away from that stuff even more so. And the device with which you could do this is already a part of the Indiana Jones brand, and that is Indy himself. Indy is a character that lives in a time period where ignorance of other cultures was commonplace. But Indy is not like that. He understands different cultures, he respects different cultures, he embraces them in a time when that was virtually unheard of. So avoiding the racial stereotypes is as simple as just having Indy be that guy, a cosmopolitan man in a xenophobic world. So Indy should know the proper customs for the different countries he's in. When he speaks a language, he should speak it correctly, maybe even using the right dialect for the right part of the country that he's in. The movie doing that kind of research and getting all those little details right will go a long way to helping us to avoid the cringingly bad racial stereotypes of previous movies. Bottom line, when Indy travels to a foreign land, it should be the way that it actually was at that time, not the way that white people who have never been there before for, imagine that it was. Also, there's no rule saying that Indy's love interest has to be a white chick. Why not have him being romantically involved with a girl of any other ethnicity? Alright, we all know that a hero is only as good as the villains he is up against, and I think we would all agree that Indy is at his very best when he is punching Nazis in the face. <laughs> So if the movie wanted to go the safe route, recycling the Nazis again would be that way to go. Sure, that's one option, but haven't we already seen that before? I mean, I would rather that they take a chance on some new bad guys. But that does present a challenge, because how do you give Indy some good bad guys without vilifying an entire country and undoing all of the stuff that we just talked about in the previous point? I mean, you can punch a Nazi in the face and no German people are going to be offended by that, because it's a Nazi getting punched. But if you make the Soviets the bad guys, or the Chinese the bad guys, you risk offending an entire country. And as Red Letter Media pointed out in his review of Crystal Skull, because they wanted to avoid that, they blurred the lines between India and the Soviets, they made America seem more evil and the Soviets seem more relatable, in an effort to balance things out, so as not to offend anybody. But the end result was we didn't get any real bad guys. So what's the solution? Do we just have to recycle the Nazis forever? Or is there some other way around this? I think the answer lies partially in Temple of Doom. True, that was the most racist of all the indie movies, but having Indy fighting a death cult rather than a whole nation kind of separates it from the racial issues. They're not evil because they're Indian, they're evil because they're devil worshippers. So why not expand on that idea? What if we introduced an Indiana Jones version of Hydra? or Spectre, as it is in the James Bond world. Some kind of organization that like spans the world and has people everywhere in lots of different countries. That way, it takes race and nationality out of the equation. They're villains not because of their race or nationality, it's because they're associated with this organization. Then we can have bad guys be of any ethnicity or nationality and it won't matter. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha!
Let this be a reminder to you all that this organization will not tolerate failure. I mean, when you think about it, Indy's not the only person that's interested in these magical artifacts. There's lots of other people out there looking for them. So why not put all those guys together, have them form a network that spans like the globe looking for artifacts with hidden powers, give them a name, and then we've got our new Nazis. A group that Indy can constantly butt heads with wherever he goes. That way we never have to struggle to come up with new bad guys for future movies, and we don't need to worry about offending anyone. Now I know, sure that does seem like a bit of an odd fit for an indie movie, at least at first, but if it's executed right I think it could work, and let's face it, this is the age of franchises. They're not going to be happy with just making this movie, they're going to want to set up for a whole new franchise. And how many more movies could we get out of having the Nazis as the bad guys? Maybe just one? And then we're going to need new villains anyway. But since you can't use any other country for bad guys without offending people, create an indie version of Hydra and they can be the new Nazis. All indie movies by nature involve a lot of traveling, but there is always one place where we seem to spend more of our time. In Raiders it was Egypt, in Temple of Doom it was India, in Holy Grail it was mostly Europe, in Crystal Skull we spent most of our time in the jungle. It's important to pick a main culture and spend a decent amount of time there, enough that the audience actually feels like they're exploring this new land alongside Indy. And one place that we haven't seen yet in Indiana Jones films is Japan. I mean sure we did see some of Asia in the beginning of Temple of Doom, but that was China, not Japan. And Japan in the 1930s before World War II was very very different. Japan was right in the buzz of the Cultural Revolution. From top to bottom the country was transforming itself from an ancient feudal state to a modern industrial nation. Clothing changed, food changed, all these aspects of daily life changed. It wasn't that there was just a change in government. What you smelled walking down the street changed. There was really a sense that a way of life, a world, disappeared in a matter of 15 years. The goal, build a modern nation and turn Japan from a land of the samurai to an industrial and military power. The result being this fascinating mixture of East meets West and the ancient meeting the modern. You've got old school samurai knights at the same time as a modern army is being trained. You've got motor cars and railway trains carrying geishas. It was a fascinating time period. And what better setting for an old franchise to be reborn in than in a nation that was itself being reborn at that time. Plus, if our main culture is Japan, then that means we can get to see ninjas in the movie. Yes, ninjas. I would love to see Indiana Jones fighting a bunch of ninjas. Which leads me to my next point. Don't skimp on the action scenes. Yes, Indiana Jones does need to get a rating that will allow for young people to go and see it, but that doesn't mean you need to remove all the grit either like Crystal Skull did. And I'm just gonna say it, it is okay to kill people in kids movies. It is. Bambi's mother died. Simba's dad was trampled to death. Batman's parents were shot right in front of him. Spider-Man's uncle was murdered. And no kids have been scarred by that, so what's the problem? You can have action and death in a movie and still have it be suitable for little kids. It's just about finding the right balance. Like when I was a kid and I saw the guy getting his heart ripped out in Temple of Doom, that freaked me out. But the face melting scene, I thought was kind of cool. So it's about knowing where that line is, having enough action in it so that the movie's still got guts, but without freaking out the little kids. Find the balance, that's all I'm saying. The last piece of the Indiana Jones puzzle is the artifact. What is this thing that everyone's going after and what does it do? The key to this, keep it simple. The Ark of the Covenant could make an army invincible. The Holy Grail makes you live forever. The Sankara stones in Temple of Doom were not so much a weapon that needed to be kept out of the wrong hands, but rather something that keeps this village alive and healthy that the people need back. In all three cases, you're very clear about why these items are important. 
In Crystal Skull, it was never really clarified as to why the skull is so important. It was supposed to be a mind control weapon, but it doesn't really work when they use it on Indy. And even if it did work, who cares? What are the Soviets going to do? Go around to every single person on the planet one by one, turning them all into communists? Now granted, in these movies it always turns out that the items don't work how the people expect them to, but regardless, we at least know what all the fuss is about. So basically, it doesn't really matter what the artifact is, just as long as we set clear rules as to why it's important. And I would say, just use one of the artifacts that's from the Indiana Jones Expanded Universe in one of the books, or one of the video games. There's some really good ones in there. One in particular that caught my eye was called the Knife of Cain, which is a religious item similar to the Ark or the Grail. But this is based off Cain and Abel, who were the two sons of Adam and Eve, and Cain killed his brother Abel, becoming the first ever murderer. So the Knife of Cain is supposed to be the weapon in which he did that. In the book, it basically just makes the person who has it invincible, but there's a lot of cool powers that you could give an item like that, considering that's where it's said to have come from. Like perhaps the knife is able to like summon the ghost of Cain, and then you can send him off to like kill anyone you want anywhere in the world. You know, that'd be a really dangerous tool in the wrong hands. You could wipe out half of the world's leaders in a week if you wanted to. And the indie style twist at the end could be maybe it doesn't just summon the ghost of Cain, it also summons his righteous brother Abel, who is able to smite him and strike him down, as well as all the bad guys, in true Indiana Jones style. I mean, that's what I do. I just have Indy going to Japan during the Cultural Revolution in search of the Knife of Cain, and he's going up against an evil ninja death cult, which is part of the Hydra type group that's trying to get this knife so they can use it for their assassination plans. And along the way, he falls in love with a Japanese girl, and when that scene comes along that requires him to fight a guy much bigger than him, he could fight a sumo wrestler. Yeah! Anyway, that's what I would like to see. But I'm interested to know what you guys would like to see in a new Indiana Jones movie. Here's my question for you guys. There are a ton of items that could be used in the indie film. The top ones that people talk about are the Lost City of Atlantis, Noah's Ark, and the Fountain of Youth. Which one of those would you like to see most in an indie movie? Or maybe you have a completely different one in mind. Put your thoughts below, let me know. I am Bandit, this is Bandit Incorporated, and until next time, I will see you guys in the comments. Well, what if way back in the ancient times, Skull Island was the setting for a massive battle between Godzilla and another kaiju, and after Godzilla killed his opponents with a blast of atomic breath, that atomic breath settled down onto Skull Island and the radiation from that is what caused all the animals to grow much much bigger. And doesn't Skull Island have like a mountain in the middle of it that's shaped like a giant skull? So what if Godzilla dragged the dead body of his opponent into the ocean, leaving behind only its severed head, which decomposed into a skull and over time became fossilized and incorporated into the topography of the island as a big mountain at the island center. Hence, Skull Island. Makes sense, right? The back story for this could be communicated through the tribes people of the island telling the legend of how Skull Island came to be born with maybe some cave painting illustrations so that we can recognize Godzilla as the victor of that fight. However, some people have pointed out that while King Kong is very big, he's nowhere near as big as Godzilla is. But if all the animals on Skull Island became giant from the atomic breath radiation, then another dose